uh, Friday on page 1670, which is the beginning of scene four, or we left off previous, um, and we're picking up with scene four. Hamlet is on his way to the coast to catch a ship to England. He's being escorted by Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And on their way, as they're marching across some Danish plain, they see Fortinbras with his army. Fortinbras, the young prince of Norway. Right? And Fortinbras and his men, you know, kind of like enter one side of the stage and march off to the other side. And Hamlet stops and talks with the captain. He asks him, you know, whose powers you are? He says, Norway, et cetera, et cetera. He says, what's your purpose? We're going to fight against Poland. Hamlet's like, okay. Who commands them? Um, the nephew to old Norway, Fort Bra. He goes, okay. And they keep talking. And Hamlet says, you know, are you going against all of Poland? I mean, is this an invasion force? He goes, no, no, no. It's just a little piece of land. We go to gain, line 18 or so, a little patch of ground that hath in it no profit but the name. That is, this is a little, no nothing, worthless piece of territory. The only profit it hath in it is it's part of Poland, like the D on a map. He says, to pay five ducats, five, I would not farm it. I wouldn't pay five dollars to farm this plot of land. Nor will it yield to Norway on the pole a rank or rate should it be sold in fee. That is, and if Norway win it, it he wouldn't even get that much out of it. Hamlet, why, then the Polak will never defend it. That is, the Poles won't defend it if it's worthless. He goes, no, actually, it's already garrisoned. They've already got their troops set up. Hamlet, 2,000 souls and 20,000 ducats will not debate the question of the store. 2,000 souls, 20,000 pounds, dollars. He says, that won't solve this issue. Okay. The captain leaves. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern leave. And Hamlet's left alone for another soliloquy. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. What is a man, if his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed? What is a man, Hamlet asks, if he spends all his days doing what? Eating and sleeping. If that's all he does with his life, he's a beast no more. Sure, he that made us, God, with such large discourse, looking before and after, discourse, reason, okay, looking before, where'd we come from, <coughs> after, where are we going to, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused. To fust, to grow moldy. Well, why does something grow moldy? Because it's not handled, it's not touched, it's not used. If it's food, it's not eaten. Okay? So, Hamlet says, reason hasn't been given to us to not be used. Now, whether it be bestial oblivion or some, scrape, some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event, the thought which courted hath but one part wisdom, never three parts coward. I do not know and why, why yet I live to say this thing's to do. What's the this thing's to do? Kill Claudius. He doesn't know if he is being wise in trying to figure out a means. Okay. He's kind of saying, my reason is growing moldy because I haven't acted yet. So, Examples gross as earth exhort me. Exhort. They encourage me. They spur me. Examples gross as earth. Gross means large. Earth, it's everything. It's everything we see around us. He says, everything I see encourages me what? Kill. For example, look at this army here. Of such mass and charge, led by a delicate and tender prince, whose spirit with divine ambition puffed, makes mouths at the invisible event. Divine ambition. He wants to be more than what he is. Okay. 
exposing what is mortal and unsure to all that fortune, death, and danger dare, even for an eggshell. He's willing to put everything on the line, he says, for what? For an eggshell. Now, he doesn't mean literally an eggshell. What does he mean? He means that little plot of land is like an eggshell. Why an eggshell? Why not a brick? Why not a lead bar? Why not a bar of gold? What's the difference between those three things? Brick, lead bar, bar of gold, and an eggshell. They're worth more. They're worth more? What else? Eggshell breaks very, very easily. It's very, very gentle or fragile. So, rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument. Rightly to be great. To be a great power, to be a great person, to have a great reputation, right, is not to stir without great argument. That is, is to not move into a course of action without a great reason for doing so, or a great argument or thesis that spurs you on. He's saying what Polonius told Laertes. Don't get into an argument. What? If you can, if you can. But once in, what does Polonius say? Bear it so that the opponent knows never get involved in an argument with you again. So, rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument. What did it take to get the United States involved in World War II? Pearl Harbor. That's a pretty great argument. They pretty much, the Japanese pretty much demolished the Pacific Fleet. Not entirely, but did a pretty good job. Okay. What finally woke the United States to the problem of terrorism? Because terrorism didn't start on 9-11-2001. I'm old enough to remember the plane hijackings going back to the early 1970s. I remember the Munich Olympics when the PLO captured 11 Israeli athletes and killed them. And everything that happened since then, they, they weren't little isolated events. They, they happened somewhat repeatedly. The United States never got involved. Okay? It was 9-11 that the press even said, you know, Rouse a sleeping giant, so to speak. Rightly to be great, he says, is not to stir without a great argument, a big reason. All right? Fine. But greatly to find quarrel in a straw when the honor's at the stake. That is, that is also something great ones do. What do they do? Look at that again. Greatly to find quarrel in a straw when the honor's at stake. What does he mean by, by a straw? Does he mean a literal straw? No. You've heard the phrase, it was the final straw that broke the camel's back. That's the lightest, smallest, littlest, most insignificant thing. Rightly, to be great is to take the lightest, most insignificant little, I don't know, let's say um, name that somebody calls you, and to respond. Why? When honor's at stake. So what's honor? Integrity? See, honor isn't a word we use very much anymore because it's old-fashioned. It's, it's it's no longer, you know, believed to be significant. The, the um, guy that Trump nominated for Supreme Court Justice, he's been saying for a week, you know, champing at the bit to get back and testify. To do what? He said, to defend his integrity. So what's integrity? What's honor? It's something you build up. It's not something you're born with. In the Middle Ages, a lot of literature wrestled with that notion. 
because it was thought you are born honorably, depending on where you were in the social status. Okay? In our day, it's what you build up. It's what you create in terms of what people think of you. Most people, I don't care your political stance, would say Donald Trump is not an honorable man because of the way he's lived his life. Multiple lawsuits for backing out of deals, not paying people, etc. You know, however many lovers, all that kind of stuff. But most people would also say, who can I pick? Mother Teresa, here's one, was an honorable person. She spent her life doing what? Helping the poor in Calcutta and died helping the poor in Calcutta. So for her, the honor is the respect accorded to her based upon the actions she performed through her life. Hamlet is saying, when that kind of honor, when the name you've built up for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years is, let's use a modern legal term, slandered or libeled, then you have to do what? You have to defend yourself, even if it is something small and insignificant. Your mother, Teresa, had said, yeah, well, I saw her go into a 7-Eleven once, and she stole a piece of gum. Now, that's pretty insignificant. Right? That's not like saying, you know, the Supreme Court nominee, that you groped the girl when she was 15 and you were 17. How stand I then, Hamlet says, to have a father killed, a mother stayed? Are those small, insignificant things? Are those little straws? No. A father killed, a mother stained. Most people would say, those are pretty good attacks on one's honor if honor also has to do with family name, okay? Defending one's family honor. Hamlet says, he calls these things excitements of my reason and my blood. That is, reason tells me I should do something to avenge my father and my mother. And blood. There's a short story it's on the syllabus by William Faulkner, we'll be reading, if we ever get to it. Where, you know, there's the language of the old fierce pole of blood. If you don't have your blood to stick with you, who's going to stick with you kind of thing? Okay? Hamlet says, I've got all these things, and you let all sleep. That is, I let these excitements, these reasons, sleep. This is Act 4, Scene 5. What's the point he's getting at? He found out in Act 1, Claudius killed his father. And he's like, tick tock. I still haven't done anything. While to my shame I see the imminent death of 20,000 men. 20,000. For what? That for a fantasy and trick of fame, Go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot, whereon the numbers cannot try the cause. 20,000 men are going to die for this little crap piece of land. And he says their numbers, both the numbers of the dead and the numbers, the amount, monetary value the land is worth, cannot try, try, prove, justify the cause. Hamlet's saying, let me back up. I remember the Vietnam War. I'm old enough to remember that. Remember watching the news, late 60s, early 70s, almost every night, when one of the newscasters would, you know, announce the body count for that day, both dead and wounded. And in some instances, the body count would be given for 
particular offensive actions. You know, a particular company, platoon, squadron, whatever, went to take XYZ property. Usually it was a hill somewhere in Vietnam. And it would be the case of, you know, X many Marines or soldiers died taking this hill. And the very next day you would hear the military then abandoned that hill. That is, they determined after taking it, it's not worth taking. What's that say about the 40 men who died taking that hill? Okay. Same kind of thing I think applies today in Afghanistan. We're long past the reason why we went over there. So they go to their bed, graves like beds, fight for a plot where on the numbers cannot try the cause, which is not too enough incontinent to hide the slain. The amount of land they're actually fighting for, Helen suggests, isn't even large enough to bury all of them. What's his point? And yet these 20,000 men are willing to die for that, and I? <laughs> I haven't done anything. Therefore, oh, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth. Bloody. May I only think of blood. Kill Claudius, you know. Yeah, but that's what he said in Act 1. And he hasn't been killing Claudius. Okay? So, scene 5. We see Horatio enter with the queen and Ophelia. <coughs> Ophelia asks, Where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? Line 22. What is she talking about? Hamlet. Okay. So she then starts going into sing song kind of stuff. And the king comes in. He sees her. Yes, how long has she been like this? Ophelia, I hope all will be well. We must be patient. If I cannot choose but weep, to think they would lay him in the cold ground. My brother shall know of it. And so I thank you for your good counsel. Come, my coach. Good night, ladies. Good night to the sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. And she leaves. Okay. What's she showing us? I hope all will be well. I hope everything will turn out just happy for people. We must be patient. Patient for what? That all will be well. But what does patient also mean? We have to endure. We have to overcome. We have to suffer. Okay. So she leaves. King, keep a close eye on her because she's not well. And he says why he thinks she's not well. Her father's slain. She is divided from herself and her fair judgment. Without the witch, line 80, Three, we are pictures or mere beasts. If we are divided from our judgment, he says we're just like the animals. We're going to see that idea come up later. Okay. So the messenger comes in. Says, uh, Laertes is back. And not only is he back, but what are the people saying? We want Laertes to be our king. Laertes for king. Does Laertes have any claim to the kingship? Is he in line for the kingship? Nope. He's not royalty at all. He, he has no connection. Okay. So Laertes comes in and he kind of says, Why haven't you avenged my father's death? And the king and the queen are like, Chill out. Laertes, where's my father? Dead. Queen, not by him. Claudius didn't do it. Don't kill him. Okay. So Laertes says, how came he did? Top of 1675. I'll not be drunk. Don't mess with me. To hell allegiance, vows to the blackest devil. Conscience and grace to the profoundest pit. Conscience and grace are kind of like elements, ministers of God. Conscience, the kind of like the law of God written on your heart. 
Grace, that's from, he's going, don't talk to me about Jesus. Jesus can go to hell because I'm going to kill whoever killed my father. Okay. So they get Laertes to calm down a little bit. And Ophelia comes in. And Ophelia, uh, Laertes, sees her. Crazy. And he starts off all over again. Okay? So, the king tells Laertes, line 195, page 1676, I must commune with your grief. I've got to, I've got to take part of your grief. I have to help you with your grief. All right? He says, but hold on, you and I will talk later. Scene six, Horatio comes in with a gentleman, the first sailor, and he's reading a letter from Hamlet, and he's telling Horatio, deliver this other letter to the king. Scene seven, Laertes and the king come in, and Laertes is like, why haven't you killed Hamlet? He killed my father. King, well, you know, there's two good reasons. One, his mother loves him and dotes upon him. Okay. What's the other one? The people love him. Love him to such an extent, Claudius implies, that if I were to do something against him, they would respond against me. In other words, it's all about self-preservation. Why, you know, he says his mother loves him and dotes on him, and she, so conjunctive. He can't do anything that would harm her. Why? Because he loves her so much. Or because he's codependent. One of those, you take your pick. Okay? So, Laertes. All right, I get it. So I've got a father lost and a sister crazy, and that's fine with you. No, 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 no. We're going to, King says we're going to solve that. Messenger comes in, bearing the letter from Hamlet slash Horatio, and the king reads from Hamlet. High and mighty, you shall know I am set naked on your kingdom. Your gloss says, without retinue. Yeah, that's one meaning. Another meaning is without clothes, but he doesn't mean that. It also means opposed. I am set opposed on your kingdom. You and I, we're going to dance, Claudius. So he says, and I'm going to meet you tomorrow and, and tell you of the strange wonder of my return. Notice, Hamlet is implying to the king what? I know why you sent me to England. <laughs> and undoubtedly, you have to be wondering, how am I back? Okay. So, the king of Laertes devise a plan. The king says, 1680, so I've, I've heard about you at school. I've heard you're a pretty good fencer, you're a pretty good swordsman. Yeah, I'm not so bad. Hamlet, meanwhile, is fat and out of shape. Right? Hamlet told us early on, when he was talking to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, he doesn't keep to his daily exercises. He hasn't been practicing. All right? So, King asks Laertes, was your father dear to you? And he's like, what are you, what are you getting at? Well, what would you do if you could? Line 124, cut his throat in the church. Now that's a sacrilege, to kill somebody in the church. It's a sacrilege to kill somebody outside the church too, but it's a double sacrilege to do it in the church. Okay? He says, okay, okay, so you want to kill him, all right. Let's work this out. Let's, let, let's have a sword fight between you two. And let's say your sword becomes unbated. That is, it doesn't have a, like a plug on the tip. He's not talking a sword you know, shaped like this. He's talking a foil, which is like a square rod long. So it doesn't have a sharp edge. But it's got a point. He's saying, and 
normally in a fencing contest, the point is tipped. It's got a piece of rubber or wood or something so that you can't run someone through. He says, but we'll take your tip off. And Larry's like, good idea. And I will anoint that tip with poison. So when I do hit Hamlet, he'll get poison, and the poison will be such that there's nothing to stop you from dying. King, oh yeah, that's a good idea. And I will have a cup prepared for Hamlet, and I will put poison in it. Okay? So if the tip doesn't work, because Hamlet's fat and out of shape, he's going to get thirsty very quickly. He'll drink the poison. Queen comes in. 1682. Right in the middle of the page. One woe doth tread upon another's heels. That is, one woe's gone. Here's that other one. You're right behind. What's the one woe gone? Polonius' death. Might there be others? Hamlet seniors? And she tells us Ophelia's drowned. And how? She was climbing into a willow tree, the branches hung out over a brook, and apparently she was gathering flowers, because the last time we saw her, she was singing songs about flowers. And she was gathering flowers from the brook water lilies or something, and, oops, fell into the brook. There's a, I should have brought it. There's a famous portrait, a famous painting of this from the pre-Raphaelites in the mid-19th century, and it's Ophelia lying kind of like this in the water, her dress all flowing out around her. But this is a dress with a lot of fabric. If you've ever jumped in a river, ocean, lake, fully clothed, you know, those clothes weigh you down quickly. And she's just, la, 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 la. You know. So she's drowned. We get act five. What does act five, scene one, serve as? What's its purpose? Comic relief. Comic relief. Why? Why do we need comic relief? What's happened throughout act four? Well, what's happened beginning with Act 3? Act 3, we see a death. Act 4, we see a death. And what else? We see the tension and the stress rise as Laertes returns, ready to kill. Okay. So Shakespeare knows, i gotta, I got to thing, tone things down a little bit. i got to give the people a little bit of release. So we have the clowns come in in a churchyard. These aren't clowns, you know, people dressed like bozo, red nose. These are just grave diggers. They're clowns because they are uneducated, lower class, like bottom class. Okay? They're ditch diggers. She should be buried in Christian burial when she willfully seeks her own salvation. And these two, by the way, they often speak in a cockney accent. She should be buried in Christian burial when she willfully seeks her own salvation. Kind of like that. I think she is. Therefore, make her grace strike the crowner. I sat on her and find the Christian burial. Crowner, the coroner. There's been a coroner's inquest to determine how did she die? Was it an accidental death? Or was it suicide? Because if it's suicide, she shouldn't get Christian burial. She should be buried outside the churchyard where the damned get buried, you know. Second cloud says, yep. Okay, so they keep talking back and forth. And let's see here. Hamlet comes in with Horatio. And the second clown leaves. The first clown's left there. He's in the grave. He's digging. And he's singing while he digs, you know, because he remembers Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And, you know, sing while you work, and it makes the work go by quickly. And Hamlet, has this fellow no feeling of his business? Line 57. That is sick to crane making. In other words, this is a solemn, somber affair. You shouldn't be singing. You should, you know, be reciting scripture or something. Custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. 
custom, habit. Okay? He's turned kind of a dreary job into an easy job. Kind of like what Hamlet said to his mother about even if you don't, even if you aren't virtuous, assume a virtue. Tonight. Don't sleep with Claudius. So it'll make it easier tomorrow, etc. Okay? So he throws a skull up. The skull had a tongue in it once and could sing. Hamlet says, you know, that might have been a pain of a politician, which this ass now overreaches, one that would circumvent God. How can a politician circumvent God? What does circumvent mean? To go around. So how do you try to circumvent God? You try to go around God's laws. You try to pull a fast one. Or it could have been a courtier, Hamlet says. Yep, Horatio. There's another. He throws up another skull. So that's two skulls now. He says, that could have been a lawyer. Yep. Keep digging. Keep singing. And Hamlet asks him, line 100, Whose grave's this, sirrah? Page 1685. Mine, sir. Hamlet, I think it'd be thine indeed for that lies did it. Now, he's not literally lying, but he is in the grave. First clown, you lie out on it, sir, and therefore it is not yours. For my part, I do not lie in it, yet it is mine. They keep talking. Hamlet asks, what man, man does not dig it for? No man. Well, what woman? Well, none neither. Well, who is to be buried in it? One that was a woman. Now, what has the clown slash grave digger just shown us? We once had a president infamous for saying in a legal deposition, well, it depends on what the meaning of is is. Okay? It depends on what the meaning of is is. Everybody knows what the meaning of is is. This president had been a lawyer also. What is the clown doing? Hamlet asks... What man dost thou, that's present tense, dig it for? First he said, whose grave is this? Present tense. What man dost? Present tense, none. Well, what woman? None. Well, who is, present tense, to be buried in it? One that was a woman. Why? Because Ophelia now is no longer a woman. Why? Because women are living things. Men are living things. Once the life goes out of them, they're what? Carrion, breeding, uh, maggot, breeding, carrion, as Hamlet already suggested. Okay? Hamlet, how absolute the name is. In other words, boy, does this guy zoom in on the meanings of words. So he asked him, how long have you been grave maker? Of all the day in the year, came to that day our last King Hamlet overcame foot and brawl. Okay, so at the beginning of the play, we hear the three sentinels talking about why they're keeping watch. And we're told it's because young Fortinbras of Norway is, you know, feeling a little bit full of himself and he wants to test the new king of Denmark. Why? Because the old king of Denmark killed his, Norway's, father. The implication is it happened relatively recently. So, I became clown, grave digger. He says, um, when old Hamlet overcame Fortinbras. Well, how long is that? When was that? Hamlet asks. Don't you know? Every fool can tell that. The very day young Hamlet was born. He that is mad is sent into England. We still don't know how old Hamlet is, but we're going to find out in just a few years. years moments. So, Hamlet, why was he sent in England? That is, why was Hamlet sent to England? The clown doesn't know this is Hamlet. He says, well, because he's mad. Shall we cover his wits, or if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. But why not? Because it won't be seen in him there. All men are mad to see there. So, Hamlet says, 
Well, how? How did he lose his wits? Well, uh, very strangely, they say, how strangely? Face even with losing his wits. Upon what ground? Upon what ground? Upon what basis? What was the cause of Hamlet losing his wits? Why, here in Denmark. That is, this is the ground that Hamlet was on when he lost his wits. We're talking like this, right? And then he answers the question that Hamlet asked earlier. When did you first become gravedigger? I've been sexton here, man and boy, 30 years. That's how old Hamlet is. See, when we're introduced to Hamlet, beginning of the play, he doesn't sound like he's that old. And when Polonius and Laertes talk to Ophelia about Hamlet, it definitely doesn't sound like he's 30. Because they talk about young Hamlet when he comes into his star, blah, 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 blah. He sounds like a teenager. He's 30 years old. And yet, what's he doing? Why is he in Denmark right now? I don't mean because he came back from England. Why does, you know, his mother tells him at the beginning of the play, Hamlet, stay. Where would rather Hamlet be? Where did he come from? For his father's funeral and mother's marriage. Wittenberg, where he was a student, and he's 30. Now, he's not a doctoral student. He's not a master's student. He's a student. He's a perpetual student. But what else does he have to do? He's the prince. What does Prince Charles do today? Whatever his mama tells him to do. Go open this thing. Go celebrate this thing. Give money to this charity. Found this foundation. He has no job other than king in waiting, ultimately. And his eldest son, king, king in waiting. So, Hamlet and the clown keep talking, and the clown pulls up another skull. He says, well, here's one that's been in the ground for 23 years. Whose? York, the clown says. Hamlet, this? Yeah. Let me see. He takes the skull, holds it in his hand, looks at it. Alas, poor York. He doesn't say, alas, poor York, I knew him well. It's one of the famous lines that Shakespeare never wrote. Just like uh, Casablanca, the one guy asked the other guy, play it again, Sam. Nope, he never does. He says, play it again. Not the Sam part. Alas, poor York, I knew him, Horatio. So who was York? He says, a fellow of infinite jest. He was the court jester. The Hamlet said, carried him on his back a thousand times. Okay? So he looks at York's skull and says, you know, where, here where those lips used to be, your eyes, etc., etc. He says, Horatio, tell me something as he keeps holding the skull. What? You think Alexander looked in this fashion in the earth? Alexander the Great. You think he looked like this after he'd been in the earth for 23 years? Yep. And smelled like this? Yep. To what base uses we may return, Horatio? What does he mean, base uses? No, take the uses off for a minute. To what base we may return? For out of the ground did I take you, and to the ground you shall return. From dust to dust. That's what he means by base. The base of our physical stuff. Okay? Uses? But what's going to happen to us once we return to dust? Well, what did he tell Claudius in the previous act? When Claudius says, where's Polonius? Oh, at a politic convocation of worms. And he goes into that thing about worms and dead bodies. And what can dead bodies become? They get eaten by the worms. You take the worm, you put the worm on your hook, you go fishing, you catch a fish. The fish eats the worm, you eat the fish, fish, 
You eat the dead body that the worm ate, and the dead body can be your emperor or Caesar. Thus, an emperor or king goes a progress through the guts of a beggar. Okay? So, to what base uses we may return? He said, why not? Why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till it find a find it stopping a bunghole? What's a bunghole? It's the hole in a cask. Like a cask of beer. It's what we would call the cork that stops it. Here, it's made out of mud. It's not made out of cork from the cork tree. Hamlet is saying, that could be Alexander. Couldn't it? Twere to consider too curiously. That's Horatio's way of saying, over my pay grade. <laughs> That's to look into things too neatly, too closely. Why? Because we would rather think that when we die, you know, the <coughs> body doesn't get touched. That's why you put it in cement and lead like casket so it never corrupts it, and we just leave it there forever and eternity. Hamlet, no, 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 that's not right. But to follow him thither with modesty enough and likelihood to lead it as us. Alexander died, Alexander was buried. Alexander returned to dust, the dust of earth, of earth we make loam. And why of the loam whereto he was converted might they not stop a beer barrel? Imperious Caesar, dead and turned to clay, might not stop a hole to keep the wind away. Oh, that that earth which kept the world in awe should patch a well wall to expect to expel the winter's flaw. In other words, if this weren't a cement block room and building, but this were a log cabin, rather than have the mortar between logs, you might have mud and straw. And that mud and straw might be the you know, remains of, let's use one of our founders, you know, Washington or Jefferson or Lincoln, etc. Right? And in comes the king and queen and Laertes in the funeral, burying Ophelia's body. Hamlet sees Laertes. We hear Laertes say a bunch. We hear the priest say she can't have a Christian burial. We hear Laertes go, buddy, she's got to have a Christian burial. They put her in the ground. And Hamlet, what? The fair Ophelia? Where's he been? Tramping across the plains of Denmark. He hasn't heard that Ophelia is dead. Laertes leaps into her grave and says, kill me with her. Pile all the dirt on. Let me die with her. Hamlet advances. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis, whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand? This is I, Hamlet, the name. And he jumps in the tomb or into the grave with Laertes. Why? What does this tell us about Hamlet beginning of the play in opposition to what Laertes and Polonius said? He said, how dare you out-love me? Well, hopefully it's a different kind of love. You know? Laertes, the devil take thy soul. You would think Laertes has you know, some reason to say this. He killed his father. And he's also ascribing to Hamlet the cause of Polonius, of Ophelia's death. Hamlet, thou praise not. I pray thee take my fingers from out my nose. Thou praise not well. That's not a good Christian prayer. To say, Satan take you. So, they pull them apart. And the queen says, in response to Hamlet's, you know, long speech beginning with his wounds, show me what thou wilt do, we would fight, we would fight, I'll do all this. This is mere madness. And thus a while the fit will work on him. In other words, he goes through these fits. He'll calm down in a while. So what does the queen, queen do? The king, excuse me, says, Horatio, calm him down. Take him away. So Hamlet and Horatio go away. Scene two. I'm going to skip a bunch. 
Hamlet tells Horatio what Rosencrantz and Guildenstern were supposed to do. And instead, he switched the letters bearing the mandate saying kill Hamlet to the king. And now the letters say kill the bearers of the letters. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Right. Pick up with about line 62 or so. Ham Horatius says, what a king is this? In response to Hamlet saying, the king put him up to it. They got what they deserved. Hamlet, does it not, does it not think thee, stand me now upon? He that hath killed my king, whored my mother, popped him between the election and my hopes, thrown out his angle for my proper life, and with such cousinage. Right? So he's just said a bunch of things. Killed my father, slept with my mother, got between me and my hopes. His election? The Germanic system wasn't just eldest son automatically becomes king. The king has a system of has a group of advisors. They elect that eldest son to be the king. Hamlet saying, it was mine. It was mine. And he got between me and my hopes. So he's saying, and he's going to pay for it. All right, we'll stop there. We'll pick up with 1692 on Wednesday. We'll finish Hamlet on Wednesday. There will be a quiz over Acts 3 through 5.